It seems to me that everyone here desires to get a better understanding of the Bible. And that's a good thing. And there are several different effective ways to gain a better understanding of the Bible. For example, you could do word studies. You could look at things by chapter. You could study a specific text. You could look at things topically. There are several ways to get a better understanding of the Bible, but all of them involve an open Bible. There's no way to get a better understanding of the Bible with a closed book. One of the things and one of the ways we have chosen to, or we are choosing to get a better understanding of the Bible is by character studies. And we're talking about Bible characters from A to Z. And not all the characters in the Bible are good. Some of them did very terribly. But it's in the Bible, and we can learn things from their lives. So tonight we're going to talk about Rachel. Rachel. Beautiful and well-favored. There are five B's that we're going to talk about with regard to Rachel tonight. Number one, we're going to talk about Rachel, the daughter of Laban, was a believer in the one true God. We'll establish that scripturally. Number two, we're going to talk about Rachel, kindred of Jacob. That is, they were probably cousins. We'll establish that. But she was beautiful. The Bible settles that. Number three, Rachel, wife of Jacob, was barren and had no children for a while. Number four, Rachel, mother of Joseph and Benjamin, was blessed. How was she blessed? I just told you, Joseph and Benjamin. And then number five, we'll talk about the benefits of the life of Rachel being recorded in the scripture. So that'll be really our application. Open your Bibles with me, if you would, to the book of Genesis. We'll start here in around about chapter 30. As we begin to discuss, Rachel, the daughter of Laban, was a believer in the one true God. Well, preacher, how do you figure that Rachel was a believer in the one true God. Well, let's look at Genesis chapter 30 here. Genesis chapter 30 and verse 6, And Rachel said, God hath judged me, and hath also, what does the Bible say? Heard my voice. Now what does that imply? It implies to me that she's been praying. Praying to whom? Praying to the obviously the one true God. But look also in this same chapter, but verse 22. And God remembered Rachel. When God remembers something, that means he's about to do something. And God hearkened. That is, he listened to her. He heard her. Proverbs 15, 3 teaches that the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, beholding the good and the evil. So there's nothing that goes on on this planet that God is not totally and absolutely aware of. However, everything that he knows, he does not look at favorably. From the context of those two passages, it seems not only did God hear Rachel, but he heard her favorably. Well, you know just as well as I do, I think, that prayer is a spiritual blessing. That is an advantage that the faithful children of God have. Proverbs, or You can look at Proverbs, but really 1 Peter 3.12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are attentive unto their prayers. So it is safe to conclude, and more than safe, it's scriptural to conclude that Rachel was a believer in the one true God. God hears everything. He is totally aware of everything that goes on, but he is not pleased with everything that goes on. From the context of those two passages, it seems that God was pleased with Rachel. Therefore, it is safe and more better, I guess more better, better to conclude that she was a believer in the one true God. Number two, Rachel, kindred of Jacob, was beautiful. Preacher, how do you figure that Rachel and Jacob were kindred? I'm glad you asked. Let's look in Genesis 28. Genesis 28, 1 and 2, we'll look at a few passages here. We're going to establish first that Rachel and Jacob were kindred, but then we're going to establish that she was beautiful. Genesis 28, 1, And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, verse 2 of Genesis 28, Go to Peda and Aram, to the house of Bethuel, my mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, watch it, thy mother's brother. 
Do you see that? Now look at verse 5. And Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Padan Aram unto Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah. How do you miss that? Jacob's and Esau's mother. Does that seem a little weird? Does that seem a little odd? Does that seem a little odd to marry your, what would be, what would that be? Wouldn't that be your first cousin? If your mama's brother has a daughter, isn't that your first cousin? So Jacob married Rachel, who was his first cousin. Isn't that weird? Well, listen carefully. It may seem strange to us, and in today's world it is strange. But scripturally speaking, up until, it seems, Leviticus chapter 18, maybe before then, but for a time, you could do that. Now, there could be a long scientific explanation given, and I'm not going to do it because I'm not qualified. But anyway, you could do that for a while, and there would be no repercussions from that. However, in today's world, you cannot, and I don't even think you can do it legally by the law of the land. I don't think you can legally, by the law of this land, marry your first cousin. Don't do that. Now, preacher, your point is that Rachel was beautiful. Where do you come up with that? Well, let's look in Genesis 29, beginning in verse 15. Genesis 29, 15. And Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother. Now, you understand, that means kindred. They weren't brothers, but they were kindred. Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught? Tell me, what shall thy wages be? And Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed. I've heard a lot of things said about that tender-eyed. It probably simply means her eyes were not as, as blazing as Rachel's. It had, she was not deformed or anything like that. But Rachel was beautiful and well favored. Now, Moses, most likely, is the inspired writer of all five books known generally as the Pentateuch. Those are the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Question, did Moses write his uninspired opinion? No. The Holy Spirit is the one that inspired Moses to write that. Moses may have only seen her through the eyes of his mind if he even did that. So who said that Rachel was beautiful? The Holy Spirit. That settles it. So she was beautiful. Well, how beautiful was she? Well, Jacob thought she was so beautiful that upon first sight he kissed her and lifted up his voice and wept. Where does the Bible say that? Genesis 29, 11. And Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. How beautiful was she? She was so beautiful Look at Genesis 29, 18. Jacob loved Rachel. He looked at her and said, baby, I love you. You're my first cousin, and I love you. Jacob loved Rachel how much and said, I will serve thee. Now, remember, Laban asked him, what are, you, what are your wages? You name your wages. Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. Boys, is your wife that beautiful? You may not need to answer that out loud. But have you ever seen a woman so beautiful that at first sight you say, Oh, I love you. Run up and kiss her and start crying. And then her daddy say, What do you get me for, basically? I'll give you seven years of my life. That's a knockout right there, man. Ain't it? Wouldn't you say very, very much so. That'd have to be, wouldn't it? So she was beautiful. And incidentally, he didn't just work seven years, did he? He ended up working 14. He got duped there a little bit, didn't he? So I, you do a little math. I'm 35. 14 years of my 35-year-old life would be 40% of my life. Now, if you count it from the time I was 18, now you think about it. When I became an adult, man, that's like 82, 83% of my whole life. 14 years is a long time, isn't it? But she was that beautiful. Now, some of the things that we read in the book of Genesis that may strike us as odd, 
They were lawful, and they, some of them were customs of that time and place. We don't live in this time. We don't live in this place. So to read these things and say, wow, the Bible's just so weird, it's really not. There were some things that were lawful for a period of time that are no longer lawful. There are some things that are customs that we just don't do. Okay? Number three. Rachel, wife of Jacob, was barren and had no children for a while. Preacher, how do you figure that Rachel was barren? Well, let's look in Genesis 29 and verse number 31. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, I'm going to give a little, a little excursus right here. Look back in verse 30. And he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah. What does the Bible say? Jacob loved Rachel more, loved more in verse 29, but in verse 30, Leah was hated. Therefore what? Sometimes in the scriptures, the word hate simply means love less. He had six kids with Leah. It wasn't that bad. He didn't hate her that much, did he? Do you understand? He loved her less. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Look also at chapter 30 and verse 1. And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. Now Rachel seems to reveal the prevailing attitude of women in her day. What is it? Give me children or else I die. Now, it seems to me, and here will be a little mini lesson for you, that at least in this time, with what we may see as some of their strange customs and practices, children really were in heritage of Jehovah, Psalm 127 and verse 3. Today, it seems that by and large in our society, children are looked at by some as more of a burden than a blessing. Well, what was Rachel's attitude toward children? Give me children or else I die. That's really what she wanted. She wanted children that badly. And when you look at the state of the country in which we live, where children are aborted and literally thrown in trash cans, literally, ripped to pieces and thrown in trash cans, what a sad commentary to read Rachel's attitude here. Give me children or else I die. That, and that's, that's nothing bad about her. Envy and her sister is another story. But desiring children that much, when we have people who have children and throw them in the garbage, treat them worse than dogs, what a sad commentary on America. What a sad commentary where we today are more concerned with money and things than we are people. But that's the place in which we live. And incidentally, Rachel was pretty sad, but I, I seem to recall us talking about a woman by the name of Hannah. And Hannah was sort of in this same position or predicament for a while, wasn't she? And I remember something about Hannah. Hannah remained persistent. And did her persistence pay off? Yeah, it did. Well, what do you think will happen to Rachel? She was barren for a while, but now number four, Rachel, mother of Joseph and Benjamin, was blessed. Sometimes we need to just hang in there a little while. God knows more than we know. I can't explain everything for God. I can't give you an answer for everything. But I know God does what's right. He's always working in our favor. Rachel, who said, give me children or else I die, was blessed with a child. Where at? Genesis chapter 30, beginning in verse 22. Look at it again. And God remembered Rachel. Question, did he ever forget her? No, when you read in the scriptures, God remembering, that means he's about to do something. So when God remembers in the scriptures, it's not that he ever forgot. That's a figure, of expe a figure of speech expressing that he's about to do something. God remembered Rachel. Now what did God do to her? And God hearkened to her. Well, what was she asking God for? Give me children or else I die. So obviously she was praying for children. So God hearkened to her and opened her womb. Question, is that miraculous? No, that's not miraculous. How do you explain it? God opened her womb. God opened her womb, verse 23, and she conceived and bare a son and said, 
God hath taken away my reproach. Do people still feel like that about children? I wonder sometimes. God hath taken away my, my reproach, and she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. Now, do you know that she was given another son? Yes. Where? Look at me in Genesis 35. Genesis 35, beginning in verse 16. Rachel tried to concoct some things sort of like Sarah did and try to have her handmaid, have children by her handmaid, and that, that happened. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Genesis 35, 16, and they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath, or Ephrath, and Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni. But his father called him Benjamin. And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, Ephrath, however you want to say it, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave, that is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. Rachel was a believer in the one true God. Rachel was beautiful. Rachel was barren for a while. But Rachel was blessed. And now number five. Let's talk about the benefits of the life of Rachel being recorded in the scriptures. What, of all the things that we've talked about, what, what, why is this in the Bible? I'll give you four lessons right here. Number one, the plague of polygamy. You study the scriptures carefully. You go back and look at these old patriarchs. Now, let me state this clearly. God, it was never God's plan. It was never God's plan for a man to take more than one wife. Now, they did and read about what happened to them. Every family was plagued with problems that came from having more than one wife. Now, I say that for this purpose. In this land, this country, just a short time ago, made homosexual marriages lawful. It ain't lawful. All right, we all know that. They can call it whatever they want to. That's not a marriage, no matter what it is. You watch. It don't matter if it's in my lifetime, your lifetime, 100 years from now, the same reasoning that allows a homosexual marriage will allow polygamous marriages. And watch what happens. Watch what happens. Watch what happens with these homosexual unions. Watch what happens. Look at all the problems that will come from that. And people say, well, it's my right, this, that, and the other thing, and then they'll allow polygamy. Read the Bible and see what happens with the homosexual unions, number one. It was awful. Read in the Old Testament. Do you not realize that the reason the Israelites were promised the land of Canaan is because of the sexual perversions of the people that were already in that land. And God told Israel, you go in and eradicate these people. Why? Read the scriptures. By and large, it was for sexual perversions. What is a homosexual marriage? It is a sexual perversion. What is a polygamous marriage? God doesn't wink at that stuff anymore. God doesn't overlook that like he did then. It is a sexual perversion perversion and there are plagues and problems that come from polygamy young people you need to heed that you need to listen you need to listen because it may be when you're old enough to get married a man may be able to take two wives you can't do that in God's sight you need to see the problems that come with that now number two the foolishness of favoritism you know what happens in polygamous marriages, you read it for yourself. Jacob loved Rachel. Leah was the one producing the children. Do you see that? What was so awful with Leah? Nothing. That was his lawful, legal spouse all the way around. And incidentally, Judah was one of her children. And our Lord descended from Judah, his legal and lawful wife. Now you think about that. 
What happens with polygamy? It's a plague, but it brings about favoritism. You like this one more than that one. You spend more time with this one than that one. You like this one's kids more than that one's kids. That's a mess. Why is the account of life, uh, Rachel's life in the Bible? So we can see some of these things and say, boys, we cannot make these same mistakes. We cannot allow this to pass. We have to say that cannot pass. It won't work. Read about these old patriarchs. It didn't work. Even though they may have been able to do it and God overlook it, my Bible says the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That won't work. God had it right from the beginning, brethren. One virgin man, one virgin woman, united together in holy matrimony for one lifetime. That's right. That's how it was in the beginning. You start seeing some foolishness happening here in the book of Genesis. And it starts to rear its ugly head. It may sound good, but everything that sounds good isn't good. Number three, be careful what you say. Look at me back again in Genesis chapter 30. And verse number one, be careful what you say. And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children. Now, obviously, you can read the text and see the problem was not with Jacob. Jacob was producing children by other women. Plague of polygamy. Foolishness of favoritism. When Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, What does she say? She says, Give me children or else I die. Better watch what you say. Because you read what happened at the birth of her second child. What happened? She died. Either make the tree good and his fruit good or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt for the tree is known by his fruit. Oh, generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, Jesus says this, that every idol careless word that men shall speak. They shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified. And by thy words thou shalt be condemned. That's what Jesus says in Matthew 12, 33 to 37. There is no such thing really as a careless word. Even though it can be that way, you cannot get out of something what was not there to start with. Be careful. Be careful what you say. Now, number four, her soul was departing. Look back at me in Genesis 35. You know, there are some people who believe that the only thing that we are is what we can see, that all there is to you is flesh, bone, blood, material things. The Bible does not teach that. You are a threefold being. You are body. That's what we see, but you are soul. And you are spirit. Let some of your religious friends read Genesis 35, 18 and have them explain it to you. Who think that we don't have a soul. Who thinks that this physical body is soul. Well, that's not true. Look at Genesis 35, 18 again. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing. Do you understand what that teaches? There was something leaving her body. What does the text say that it is? Soul. Now, that is nothing material at all. You cannot, we cannot see that with our human fleshly eyes. But what does the text say? Her soul was departing. That is, she was dying. Why was she dying? Because her soul was departing. That's what death is. The separation of soul and spirit from the body. There's more to life than beauty. There's more to life than successful careers. And there's more to life than having children. Do you realize that? Eternity hangs in the balance. The day will come where your soul is departing. What will matter then? John 12, 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, 
the same shall judge him in the last day. Whether you die on an operating table, in a hospital bed, in your own bed, in a car crash, wherever it is, your soul is going to depart from this body. That's going to happen. What will be said of you? Are you prepared for that? Now, there are many lessons to be learned, both good and bad, positive and negative, from the life of every person in the scriptures. What's going to be remembered about you? Anything? I may remember me in a hundred years on this planet or not, but the Lord will remember me. And he's going to remember me favorably. You know why that is? Because I do what he says. I do what the book says. Ultimately, that's what matters. Have we all set our affections on things above? Can we humble ourselves and submit to the truth of the gospel? You have to start somewhere, and it starts with the salvation of your soul and to be sure that your soul is right. You need to hear the truth, Romans 10, 17. Believe the truth, Acts 16, 31. Repent of sin, Acts 17, 30. Confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, Acts 8, 37. Be immersed in water for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. And walk in the light as Christ is in the light unto death. 1 John 1, 7 and 8. Wherever you are, we're here to help, but you have to come. Do it now. As together we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.